It's kind of crazy that Thanksgiving's Thursday, and then we got Christmas just a month away. Now, when the holiday seasons roll around, my family just kind of looks at me like I'm a ball humbug. Not because I don't like to celebrate Jesus, or I don't like to, to, to say thank you for all that God's given me, but it, it's kind of the, the, it's the decorations. It's, the, it's some of, the, some of the, the holiday culture stuff that, that we've picked up through the years. And, and when you really look at it, especially stuff like a Christmas tree, it's, it's almost like a drunk person made it up. I mean, you, you think about it. You think about the fact that you put a seven-foot, eight-foot spruce tree, cedar tree, some, a tree in your living room. Any other day of the week, your wife would walk out, well, maybe not during the holidays, and see that there and wonder what you were doing. Honey, there's a, there's a tree in our living room. It's, it's a smudge tree. Paul's on. Yes. And we're going to decorate it for Jesus. <laughs> and then we're going to take some of my socks, and we're going to hang them up over the fireplace, <laughs> and we're going to fill it with candy. And after that, we're going to get a piece of this bush, and we're going to put it right in above the door so I can kiss you. <laughs> It's bizarre, right? It's, it's bizarre. Now, it took me days of following Pastor Hooper around from club to club to get that drunk voice right. <laughs> Have you ever thought what it would be like to party with Pastor Hooper? <laughs> it's like partying with Dr. Phil. <laughs> yes. He does the robot a lot, actually, when he dances. I don't know. But holiday stuff is weird. What about Easter? Easter is a time we're supposed to be celebrating the resurrection of Christ. Eggs. But honey, eggs really don't represent Jesus. Okay, we'll hide them. <laughs> but honey, that doesn't really make sense. Okay, we'll add bunnies. And with Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving, it's like we've run out of traditions with Thanksgiving. It's like we don't have anything else to do for Thanksgiving. So it's just like, let's just eat a whole bunch. <laughs> let's just eat more. Like we don't do that every day, right? Like we don't do that every day of the week. But we'll just eat more. Now the crazy thing about Christmas and, and, and the holidays and all that kind of stuff is if you notice how sometimes stuff gets switched, gets switched around. Let's take the tree and put it inside and take the lights and put them out. <laughs> and so there's this competition that happens with, with neighbors and they, they make each other feel bad because some of them go out like Clark W. Griswold and some others don't. But the truth is, is those traditions are a little crazy. Culture is just a little goofy when it comes to that. And it truly, when you start thinking about it, you start wondering why do we do some of the things that we do? When Thanksgiving comes around, we do make sure that we bring out, though, the best as far as the china, as far as the silver, as far as the crystal. You know, because we want to we want to do we want to make sure that our guests feel honored. And then we use the dining room that nobody else gets to use for the entire year. You notice that? I mean, we have this dining room, and it's, it, every season it's decorated different. There's a, there's a harvest season with Thanksgiving colors, and then the Christmas season. And it's always decorated so nicely. And truthfully, the only people that ever get to use that in your home are the ghosts. The ghosts use it. You don't. Three times, three times a year you get to use it. But in, in, when I was growing up, we had one of those dining rooms that was a little scary. It was a little freaky. I, I didn't even like going into it. I remember dropping a quarter under the, under the table one day, and I was like, I just leave it. That's okay. Just leave that special dining room. But we do that because we want our guests to feel honored. We want them to feel special. And I've been doing uh, my quiet times or my morning uh, time with God or my qu coffee with God 
at using the message translation uh, recently because the message translation is, is this newer version of the Bible and it's kind of like reading the scripture and, and it just comes to life. It kinda, it's kind of like watching color TV over black and white TV sometimes because it's so much more descriptive. And when I was reading this certain passage of scripture, which I have read over and over again in other translations, but in this translation, this time, it just spoke to me differently. And it's 2 Timothy 2.20. And Timothy is a man that was very close to Paul. And Paul is writing Timothy a letter just to encourage him, just to give him advice, just give him, to give him things to teach. And in it, he says, In a well-furnished kitchen, there are not only crystal goblets and silver platters, but waste cans and compost buckets. Some containers used to serve fine meals, others to take out the garbage. Become the kind of container God can use to present any and every kind of gift to his guest for their blessing. Isn't that cool? In the NLT, it says, if you keep yourself pure, you will be a utensil God can use for his purpose. Your life will be ready for the master to use you for every good work. I like that because throughout the uh, scriptures, we're talked about the, as Christians, as vessels. So the Holy Spirit fills us up, and we're used as utensils, as vessels to pl- bless God's people, to minister to God's people. And so the scripture says, be the finest china. Be the, the most beautiful crystal goblet. Be that fine silver that you put, put out. Don't be a compost bucket. Don't, don't be this, the, the stuff that you would take the trash out in, but rather be something special and use that utensil. Use yourself as a utensil for God. I, I love that. And I love the fact that Scripture will not only give you a picture of what we're supposed to be and what we're supposed to act like, but it'll also tell you how to do it. Because unfortunately in life, we do things, we make mistakes, we p- make poor choices, and we don't always feel like fine china. I mean, there's times where we feel like a compost bucket. But with Scripture, if it tells you to do something, it always tells you how. And in the verses that follow, verse 22, Paul writes, this is how you're different. This is how you set yourself apart. This is how you be that utensil that God wants you to be. He says, first of all, run away from infantile indulgence. Run after mature righteousness, faith, love, peace. Join those who are in honest and serious prayer before God. Refuse to get involved in the inane discussions. They always end up in fights. God's servants must not be argumentative, but a gentle listener and a teacher who keeps cool, working firmly but patiently with those who refuse to obey. You never know how or when God might sober them up with a change of heart and a turning to the truth, enabling them to escape the devil's trap, where they are caught and held captive, forced to run his errands. So this morning, we're going to take that scripture, and we're going to break it down, and we're going to make it real practical, and we're going to look at seven things that Paul tells Timothy that we need to make sure that we do, just so we have the right skills, just so we present ourselves as the proper utensil. Now, this is something that we can use every day, but it's something we can really use during the holidays. And the first thing that we see in that scripture is it says that we should run away from infantile indulgence. Now, you might look at that and go, well, that's kind of a long word. That's kind of a ah, infantile and, and indulgent. What, what, does he re, what does he really mean by that? The NLT says anything that stimulates youthful lusts. You might go, well, youthful lusts, that's kind of, that sounds kind of churchy. Don't really get that youthful, youthful lusts. So here's the newest version. Stay away from anything that makes you act like an idiot. That's what we got to do. That's what we got to do. We got to flee those things. And for all of us, we have certain things that make us act like idiots. Some of us have more things than others that make us act like idiots. And, and, and you might even in your mind right now be going, yep, I got that. I, yeah, I, I deal with that issue. Yep, I can struggle with that. And here are some, like for alcohol, for instance. Alcohol. Alcohol isn't bad for everybody. It is very bad for some. It's not bad for everybody if you do it within the guidelines of Scripture. But there are some people that should stay away from alcohol. They should print a special label on all alcohol that says, if you're a jerk, don't drink this because you will be worse after. Like it, it, it uh, uh, shines a light on the negative viewpoints of your personality type. So if you struggle with alcohol, you should Run from it. It's a youthful indulgent, a youthful lust. 
media, uh, media, music, books, magazines. There's certain music that you can listen to that will set you off, that may, may make you act stupid, that may make you make poor choices or movies or books or whatever. So you have to watch that. You have to watch whatever it is. Uh, bars. Like, if you go to a bar and it makes you act stupid, don't go to the bar. Don't go to the bar. It's not worth it. There's one city in this country that will make everybody act like idiots. What is it? Right. Where the theme is, what happens there stays there. That's a lie. <laughs> if you get arrested in Vegas, that criminal record... <gasps> Follows you home. <laughs> if you get a DUI in Vegas, that follows you. You make a poor choice. Guess what? STDs will follow you home. <laughs> so stay away from... Go to Salt Lake if you have to. Okay? Go somewhere where you will be a good and you won't act stupid. Here's another one. People pleasing. Sometimes people... Uh, it, they will start acting youthful or, or being infantile when they start trying to please people. They, it, it, they, they'll go to great extents because they, they have, maybe have a poor self-esteem, poor self-image, and so they very much need other people to make them feel good. So they'll go to great lengths to please other people, sometimes to the point where it's just it's youthful and stupid. Uh, trying to be somebody that you're not. We put on these masks. We put on masks when we're little kids. That's what we do when we're little. So when we're putting on masks as adults, trying to be something we're not, trying to act like in a way that we're, that's not us, that's, that's just stupid. It will make us look dumb. Here's one that, where people do that a lot is online dating. Have you seen, have you, now look, I'm not against online dating. I think it could be a wonderful thing. But, but if you want to see somebody put on a mask, have them write up a profile for online dating. They never tell you the truth. They always take the pictures from the right angles, you know? And, and, and you will never see an individual that will just get on, jump online and go, okay, I'm really going to just tell the truth on this profile. Whew, so... I'm 45 years old. Um, I struggle at times with anger. Uh, I don't understand why I have hair growing out of places that I don't want it to. <laughs> and the places I want to have hair grow out of, it won't. Um, I have my back hair done in cornrows. <laughs> you will never see that. You'll just see the good stuff. Now, here's the thing that uh, <laughs> I just totally threw that last one in. I don't know where that came from. We'll reproduce the 9 o'clock service. Um, here's the other thing that I've seen. I've counseled couples before that are married that are upset with each other because they've put profiles on dating sites just to, just to make themselves feel good, just to see what's out there, just to see if they still got it, if they can still pick somebody up. So that's the kind of people that you're dealing with a lot of times online. And if, if we're not careful, we can do that. We can put masks on. We can not represent ourselves fairly to others. And those are all youthful, lustful things, infantile indulgences that can get us in trouble. Those, those couples that went down that road, it got them into trouble. It made them make poor choices. Here's the second thing we see in those scriptures. In, in the KJV, it actually says to follow righteousness. In the NLT, it says anything that wants you to do right. So if it wants you to do right, follow that. If it wants you to do stupid, run from that. I mean, Paul's pretty, pretty black and white here. That's why we're so, uh, we, we take so much time in spiritual warfare and in sermons to talk about putting on God's full armor. And one of his armaments is the breastplate of righteousness. You need to put that on every day. It seriously protects your heart. It will protect your soul. The other thing that we have to make sure of and follow Scripture in is that we have to see that we have to bring our thoughts under the obedience of Christ. Because if, if the devil's going to get you to mess up, he's going to start here. He's always going to start in your head. He's always going to start in your thought life. But when you start going down that road with your thoughts, you bring that thought under the obedience of Christ. And you say, you know what, I'm not going to go there. And, and, and in Jesus' name, I need your help, God. 
I need you to reprogram the way I've thought. Because we've done and thought the same way for so long that it starts to make these patterns in our mind and the way that we think. And so we just have to reboot the hard drive at times and think righteously. I pray this uh, scripture almost every day, and it's Philippians 4.8. And it says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. That's where our thought life needs to be. And our thought life will always determine whether or not we're righteous in our actions or not. And then we see the next part of the scripture says to pursue faith, love, and peace. In another letter, we see Paul write to Timothy these words, but you, Timothy, belong to God. So front, run from all these evil things and follow what is right and good. Pursue a godly life along with faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight for whatever, for what we believe. Hold tightly to the eternal life that God has given you, which you have confessed so well before many witnesses. Now, I love this scripture because that word pursue in Greek is dioko, which means an animal pursuing its prey. So we should go after faith, love, and peace like an animal goes after its prey. That aggressively, that, that, that strongly, that's what, we sh- what, that's what we should be doing. And if we would go after that as strongly as we go after other stuff, imagine how much e- easier our life would be. Faith, love, and peace. Sometimes this time of season, it's really hard to have that. It's hard to show some of our more difficult family members and more difficult friends that love. And it's hard sometimes when we get into these holiday situations to have peace. I mean, it's just normal. That's normal. But we've got to strive above that. We've got to be the utensils that God wants us to be. The next thing we're to do is we're, we should unite with other Christians. The NLT and the NIV in that scripture says, Join with those who call on the Lord with pure hearts. The message translation that I read earlier says, those who are in honest and serious prayer before God. Those are the people we should be around. Now, it's in, this is in here because God understands that we need each other. And we need each other to be stronger. We need each other to hold each other accountable. But it's very much culture anymore not to reach out. Not to have friends, not, not to be social. And they say that when the uh, sociologists say that, that a lot of that changed when they made the invention of the garage door. Because now people can come to their home, they hit the garage door, they go into the garage, they shut the garage door, and they never even see their neighbors. They're, 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 we've become antisocial. And God says that we need each other and it, to the point where it's like iron sharpen, sharpening iron. That we, we keep each other sharp. But if, if the devil can isolate us, if he can separate us from those that can be helpful in our life, then we're that much easier of a target. And that's why we're actually getting, getting ready to start a new ministry here at Fellowship. And it's going to be called Section Communities. A lot of times when we uh, try to get people to connect around here, we, we bring them in and we say, okay, now we, what we want you to do is we want you to come back on a Tuesday night or we want you to come back on a Wednesday night so you can connect with other singles or you can connect with other parents of young kids or you can connect with teens or whatever. And for many people in this, in, in our uh, in, in our culture now, because they're so busy, sometimes an hour a week in, in, on Sunday morning is what they can give. So what we want to do is we want to give opportunity for people when they come to church also to connect with others. So with each section in our church, we're going to basically theme those sections. And some of them are kind of already themed if you kind of look around. But what we'll do is we'll kind of, we're going to uh, name the sections. For instance, the 9 o'clock and the 11 o'clock service, this section over here, is primarily made up of 46 40 years and students. It just is. And, and not only them, but also the workers for them. So they kind of just sit there. They always have sat there. I don't know why, but they do. So that section will become our youth or student section. We may have another section that will be turned into uh, parents of teenagers or uh, might have a seniors section. Whatever basically the leader wants to do for those sections is kind of what we'll turn them into. There'll be a section leader for every section that will greet those in the section, that will uh, maybe plan an activity once in a while where you guys can do a barbecue after a service or something, but just to get us to connect. That's one reason why we close a lot of the sections in here is it forces us to sit together. Aren't we horrible about that? We're the worst. We go to movies and it's like, oh, great, I have to sit right next to somebody. Uh, 
But then we start watching the movie and we forget about it. We become antisocial. So hopefully this will kind of help us. Now know this, if you have a seat in your section and you've been there since the beginning of the building, we will not ask you to leave. We will not ask you to move if you don't fit into your section. But just know that we're going to do that so that, hey, people want to meet at church. They'll say, hey, meet me at section 11-2. That's this section right here. Come down, I'll be there, you can sit with me. So we're doing it for a lot of different reasons, but the biggest is that we'll just unite together. We'll just start creating some community and friendships that we so desperately need in our life. Number five, this is a big one around the holidays, okay? The next part of that scripture says, don't get involved with foolish, ignorant arguments. Notice the first part there, foolish. It's a stupid in the first place, right? You think about most holiday fights, when you think back about what they were, they're usually just stupid. They're foolish. And then the next part is ignorant. Ignorant means that you just don't know anything about what you're talking about. (laughs) We don't have any family members like that. We could probably just skip it, right? That just means that you're not only fighting over something stupid, you're fighting over something you don't know anything about. And yet that's what divides us. That's what causes these big fights. And so Paul, to the point where he lists out these seven things, he says, man, don't go there. Don't get involved with all these silly things. Don't quarrel. It's not worth it. And there's times with our family that we all get together, those kind of things come up. So what we got to do is we just got to decide, you know what, I'm, I'm going to change the subject. I'm going to walk away. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go there. I mean, the truth is, is that not everybody is as perfect as us. We all get caught into it, right? We can all get drawn into silly arguments that just, that just divide, that just cause problems. And here, finally, uh, the last one here is, is just be kind. Be kind. Be nice. I know that sometimes that's hard to do. But, but really, if you just think about it and just decide, you know what? I'm going to be nice. I'm not going to talk bad about my family. I'm not going to talk bad about them behind their back. I'm not going to make fun of them. I'm not going to get into an argument. I'm just going to be nice. But instead, we're like middle school girls. Right? Can you believe what she's wearing? <laughs> Ew. Can you believe the food that I brought over here? I couldn't even eat it. It was, ew. <laughs> right? I cannot believe the way they talk. <laughs> ew. Time for a selfie. Start. <laughs> I watch too much of the Tonight Show. Can you tell? <laughs> Start praying for those people that are tough now. You know the ones that you struggle with, which leads us into the final point. Teach and be patient with difficult people. It's interesting that that scripture is very specific about difficult people. Because truthfully, you don't need help with patience with fun people. You need patience with those that are difficult. Gently teaching those who oppose you. Now, I know that's tough because we all have them. We all have those family members that are difficult, that are annoying, that make us upset, that drive us crazy, that may smell funny. All of those things, they're difficult. But we are supposed to be the fine china. We are supposed to be the crystal goblets. We are supposed to be the silver utensils that God can use. And one of the ways that he uses is is interceding for those people in advance. Start praying for them now. Pray that God would just bless your time together and that you would have patience with those people. Because truthfully, God may be calling you to minister to them. The other interesting thing about this voice is it says teach and pe- uh, be patient with, uh, with difficult people, gently, gently teaching those who oppose you. So God wants to use you to teach them. Maybe, maybe whatever annoys you about them, you're supposed to help them with. Now, of course, God has to call you to do that and you have to be given an opportunity to do that. But 
we all have those tough people in our life. And some of them are family. Some of them are people that we work with. Some of them are our friends. But God calls us to be different with those people. Because you know what? They're a work in progress, just like we are. It's like Joyce Meyer says, I, I, I'm so, uh, I, I'm not happy with where I am, but thank God I'm not where I used to be, or something like that. Like we're all growing. We're all in this process. Five or ten years ago, you may have annoyed somebody so bad, but you've come out of that. So we have to be p- patient as we teach those. So this holiday season, and really in, in just applying this to daily life, let's look at this and, and really try to make ourselves what God would want us to be. Truly allow ourselves for, to, to allow God to transform us into what he wants us to be. Lord, we love you and we thank you for this time that we've had together. And we recognize, God, that we are to be the utensils that you can use. Lord, that you can bring out in the finest occasions. That you can trust, Lord, with the other people that you've put in our lives. And Lord, it's hard sometimes to act the way that we should act. It's hard to do the things that we should do in situations, especially in the heat of the moment. But I pray, Lord, that you would help us, that we would just, we'd be able to just get rid of those lustful thoughts and youthful lusts that we may have in our life. Help us to just, oh, so be bound to your righteousness and pursue your faith, love, and peace. Help us, Lord, to make the right Christian friends here at church, the right connections. Help us to stay away from foolish uh, arguments and silly quarrels. Help us just to be filled with you in such a way that we're, we're kind and we're nice. And help us to be patient. Please help us to be t- patient and give us the opportunity, Lord God, to minister to those that are closest to us. We thank you for this season. We thank you for everything you've done in our life. We thank you for what Thanksgiving is all about. And that's your blessings. We love you, God, and thank you for all of them. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Have a great Thanksgiving.